I'll uh, go through this again. It's being recorded, so you can go back and recheck it. But the uh, prologue, if you want to call it that, of the book is chapter one, verses one through four. And it uh, is broken down like this. You have the presentation, the preparation for the Son of Man. Remember in, in Luke, he's referred to as a Son of Man, identifying with humankind, chapter 1, 5 through chapter 2, 52. This involves the announcement of his impending birth, chapter 1, 5 through chapter 1, verse uh, 56. And then you had the birth of John the Immerser, verses 57 through 80 of chapter 1, the birth and youth of Jesus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 52. Then we'll call it uh, the next main point under the outline would be the presentation of the Son of Man, chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4 and verse 13. This breaks down into four so the ministry of the forerunner of the Christ, John the Baptizer, chapter 3, 1 through 20. You have the baptism of Jesus in chapter 3, 21 and 22. You have uh, the genealogy of Christ in chapter 3, 23 through 38. And then you have the temptations of Christ chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. Then the third main point is the ministry of Jesus, chapter 4, verse 16, all the way through chapter 9 and verse 50. His purpose is announced in chapter 4, verses 16 through 44. He manifests his power in chapter 5, 1 through chapter 6, 11. And uh, he, uh, he um, appoints his helpers, the apostles, chapter 6, 12 through 19. And the principles that govern him and what he teaches to others are declared in chapter 6, 20 through 49. And then we have the compassion of Jesus revealed in chapter 7, verse 1, through chapter 9 and verse 17. And in the same chapter, verses 18 through 50, he, uh, you have the uh, foretelling of his death. Then the fourth main point in the book is the mission of Jesus as he is going to Jerusalem. And by the way, any time that you travel to Jerusalem, anywhere in that area, you're going up. So if you're in the north and you go to Jerusalem, you're still going up. So he's going up to Jerusalem in chapter 9, verse 51, all the way to chapter 19, verse 28. You know what I mean by that? Well, that's this is a count of what he did when he was going up there. And he points out how that discipleship is a challenge, chapter 9, 51 through 62. We have the account of the 70 being appointed and sent out, chapter 10, 1 through 24. You have other, for lack of a better way to put it, teaching of Jesus, chapter 10, 25 through chapter 13, 21. And then we have a record of the conflict between him and the Jewish leaders, chapter 13, 22 through chapter 16, verse 31. And we have him instructing the disciples in chapter 17, 1 through chapter 19, verse 28. Then in Jerusalem, after he arrives, and that's the fifth main point, is recorded in chapter 19, verse 29 through chapter 21, verse 38. This involves the first point would be his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, chapter 19, 29 through 40. And uh, the display of his sorrow over impenitent Jerusalem over the years, chapter 19, 41 through 44. 
We have the record that Luke gives of Jesus cleansing the temple, chapter 19, 45 through 48. And we have the rejection of the Son of Man in chapter 20, verse 1 through chapter 21, verse 4. And then you have the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem, chapter 21, verses 5 through 38. The sixth main division is the passion of the Son, chapter 22, verse 1 through chapter 23, verse 56. Thus, you have the last Passover out of which he instituted the Lord's Supper. Of course, he did that with his disciples, chapter 22, 1 through 38. You have the Son of Man being betrayed in chapter 22, verses 39 through 53. Then we have the account of his arrest and um, his trial chapter 22, 54, through chapter 23, verse 25. You have the record of his death in chapter 23, 26 through 49. You have his burial in chapter 23, 50 through 56. The last main point <clears throat> for the book, as far as an outline is concerned, and I realize you can outline these different ways. You may want to do that in your own study but this is the way it works very well, it seems to me. The last main point, point seven, is the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the Son of Man, chapter 24, verses one through 53. And that section divides itself into five subsections. Um, he, as far as his resurrection is concerned, he uh, um, announces his resurrection to the women in chapter 24, 1 through 12. And then he appears to those who are walking to Emmaus, chapter 24, 13 through 35. He then appears to the 10 apostles, chapter 24, 36 through 45. We have then Luke's account of the Great Commission to the apostles in chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. And then the last thing in the book is the account of the Son of Man's ascension to heaven in chapter 24, 49 through 53. Now, I want to look at some lessons. I'll say again, as I have been looking at the other books, these are not all the lessons you can get out of this, of course. But for those looking for lessons that maybe want to be teaching something, uh, somebody or teaching lessons somewhere, as far as the book of Luke is concerned, here are some several lessons to remember. I think it's a great consolation to know that the authors of the New Testament dedicated themselves, because they must have done as Luke did, to give, as he said, an accurate message that we might have a belief based on certainty, chapter 1, 3 through 4. Those of us who would be teachers, as I said, I think last week, have a great obligation to be accurate and careful in our studies because we are persuading men. And we do not want to lead them down a path that is not accurate, that uh, where our reasoning may be wrong without all the facts, because we want their faith to rest on certainty. And this is what Luke did, and the Holy Spirit inspired him to do it, and it's not there just to take up space, but to teach us we should do the same thing in our study of the Scriptures. I think one that gets overlooked sometimes is the character of the mother of Jesus, Mary, because she's a great pattern or example for all of us. And that pattern and example that I see is her modesty and her purity. Uh, I can't imagine what went on in the mind of God when he says, I'm looking for a husband and wife to be a father and mother 
my son. Because they had a, a tremendous responsibility laid upon their shoulders. Because while he was a baby, they had to make sure that he lived according to all the dietary laws of the law of Moses. That everything was to be done. When he as a human being at that age of development wasn't able to do things for himself. And that's going to tell you how cautious Mary and Joseph were in rearing Jesus. Another point that comes out, not just of Luke, but certainly will emphasize it here, that if we really believe the virgin birth of Christ, and we believe the resurrection of Christ, it seems to me everything else about him comes rather easy. So it's not, it shouldn't be anyway, surprising to us that the devil has done a lot of attacking. He's made a lot of efforts to say Jesus was not born of a virgin and Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. So if we understand the power of God in the conception of Jesus and in the raising of Jesus from the dead, what really about him is difficult to believe as far as what the scriptures reveal? We need to know that he was so unlike the other gods of that time, and I put those gods in, with small g's, lowercase g's, and in the gods that appear in the Old Testament. He was not some sort of mythical savior. And this is what you hear me say so many times. This is the amazing thing about Christianity. Jesus was a real human being who walked this earth just as we do. And therefore, he's not some sort of mythical being. He can be located in a definite place at a definite time. His life is recorded. And his uh, death and resurrection have historical validity. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now, try to look at any of the pagan gods, whether they be the Norse gods of the Scandinavians and Germans, or whether they be the gods of the Babylonians or the Egyptians or the Romans and Greeks, and see if you can find any comparison whatsoever. This helps us maybe today to understand better the appeal of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people at that time. And why Luke would say, I have tried and have given an accurate message because I wanted certainty, not doubts, but certainty. We also need to understand this lesson comes from this, that we need to rear our children, that they will grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Chapter 2, verse 52. I guess we read that sometimes and think, well, that's, that's Jesus. Jesus did that. Well, what's that telling me about me and about mine? Because that's a good wholesome thing you'd want any, anybody to think about your life or your children's life. And then, of course, that means you have to know all the details of what goes on about that. As far as a godly example parents set before the children, the teaching that they do. And that's a very important lesson to keep in mind. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. Somebody said one time, some man was in terrible straits down in the dumps because his wife had left him. And he says, um, she just ran off. And I'm just down and out. And I was told by the Bible that Jesus has been tempted in every point like as we, like as, uh, we are as humans. Then there was married. He doesn't know what it's like to have his wife run off leaving. Well, he missed the point. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus ever forsaken? That's the point. 
you know, you can be forsaken in many ways and the same um, emotional impact hits you and the same psychological impact hits you. So that is the thing Jesus went through being forsaken by everybody. And in fact, we read where he said, God doesn't leave me. He's always with me. And you can read, of course, chapter 213, where that's going on, and then Hebrews 2, verse 15, where he's tempted in every point, like as we are yet without sin. In chapter 4, verse 24, there is the statement made about him that no prophet is acceptable in his own country. Well, what does that mean? What should I learn about that? What should you learn about it? In fact, how should that fortify us when we're out teaching? Well, it's true that if you grew up in a place and they all knew you when, all through your growing up years, that they're not going to really believe that you might know more than they do or that you're very capable or you've developed further than they have. Well, he's just old so-and-so. And that's uh, what happens. In other words, this is a sad fact that's still true. So we shouldn't let that kind of thing hinder us from doing the best we can, what we have to do with, no matter what's what, using our talents, the best of our ability. And as Christ's disciples, members of the Lord's church, another lesson is that we're here to preach good tidings to the poor, chapter 4, verse 18. Now that's strange. Why didn't he say we should make sure all poor people are fed? We well, say, well, he does teach benevolence as a part of the Christian's life, Galatians 6, 10, and so on. That's true. But he also said the poor you have with you always. There will always be people who economically are far below others. And you may not be able to help them. And one reason you may not be able to help them along that line is because they don't have the capacity to develop. Nobody seems to ever consider that, that some people just don't have the capacity to help themselves or else they're in dire circumstances where they can help themselves. If they wanted to, it doesn't make any difference. But there's one thing you can do for them, greatest thing in the world. Teach them how to go to heaven, that they won't always have to be poor. And when they're rich in spiritual things, they're the richest people on earth. That doesn't rule out the fact we shouldn't be trying as the church to help people physically in some way or the other, because as I said, the three-pronged three work of the church in saving souls is preaching the gospel of the alien sinner, edifying the saints, and then charitable activity. But nevertheless, he said the poor had the preach, had the good tidings of the gospel preached to them. Chapter 4, verse 18. Has to mean something. Then he also uh, records, and we mentioned this earlier, that Luke's the one that records this, and he himself was a physician. They that are in health have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus was called the great physician. He solved sin problems. Now, just look around about you today in our America. You think many people outside of Christ think they're sick? I'm not talking about mentally or physically sick. I'm talking about sin sick. Well, they're not paying much attention to it. There's always been some that have been that way, and more some at one time and more another. But you can't convert somebody until you get them to realize that sin's his greatest enemy and he's separated from God. If he dies in that state, he's lost forevermore in the devil's hell. Nobody's thinking that way for the most part. But that doesn't relieve us of the obligation to live right, as the Bible defines the right, and to teach the truth and to try to get people to be aware of their state of affairs. Then he talks about the new wine and compares the gospel to new wine. That doesn't fit in old wineskins. That is, in men's traditions and opinions, chapter 5, 37 through 38. 
that's as fresh as any news that came out today for the first time. We do what we like to do. Or we try to do it. And if we don't like to do what God said, we're not apt to try. So we've got to learn to like it because it's good for us. And that's how you grow. And you've got to realize that the truth of the gospel is still fresh in contrast to all the other philosophies that are out there today. People all the time in denominationalism saying, just ask Jesus to come to your heart. I saw this morning Franklin Graham coming on one of his advertisers. It's been on for a while now. He's saying, all you need to do is realize he is the Son of God and just uh, let him know you're a sinner. For other words, pray the so-called sinner's prayer. And ask him to come to your life, and it's all taken care of. Well, now you compare the plan of salvation to that. And there is no comparison. So that's just a big lie. And the new wine of Christ's gospel doesn't fit too well with that old denominational stuff. Our minds, the Bible says, are to be sober. We have to learn to think soberly. One of the things that helps us to think soberly, to face reality and facts for what they are and not try to make something else out of them that they're not, is the fact that Christ knows our very thoughts. Chapter 6 and verse 8. Another point is that if Christ found it needful and helpful to pray to God all night, all night, how much more do we need frequent, regular, steadfast sessions of prayer? You know, he was a human and overcame Satan as a human. And one of the reasons he did that is he spent so much time in communication with his heavenly father. It's one of the things. And it can't help but do us good. In chapter 6, verse 22 we have a warning again against uh, persecution. And he pronounces a blessing on those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you, and when they, uh, uh, when they shall call your name an evil thing. All for the Son of Man's sake. That is, your suffering for the gospel's sake. We don't like to be talked bad about. Nobody likes to have people saying things about us, especially if it's untrue. But when you're doing your best to know the truth, rightly divide it, live it, correct your life where you see it needs to be done, and do all the things the Bible says in living a Christian life every day, then there's a whole lot. There's one old man told me one time when I was a young preacher, he said, I just have a hole in my head. When I hear a lot of that stuff, it just goes in one ear and we say right out the other. Instead, we sometimes let all those bad things go in one ear and some way or another it gets all caught up in between before it ever can get out of the other one. So there's some things to pay attention to, some things to deal with, and some things to ignore. And then in chapter 626, and this connects with what I've just said, Woe to you when all men shall speak well of you. But don't you like people talking well about you, saying good things about you? Well, think for a minute. Would you want somebody like Al Capone speaking good things about you all the time? What would that say to people about your connection? with them. And he might be telling the truth about you. You remember the damsel that uh, was possessed, the power of divination, and her masters used her to uh, make money off of her. She followed Paul around saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. Well, that was true, wasn't it? It was very true what she was saying. But 
Paul grew weary of that and turned around with apostolic power and cast the demon out that was giving her that power. Well, why did he do that? She was telling the truth because of association, who she was, who controlled her. So beware when all men speak well of you. If you're living like the Bible said, and you're teaching the truth without compromise and love of God and love of the souls of men, you're not going to have everybody liking you all the time. You've got to learn to live with that or else you're not going to live a Christian life. Again, I simply point you back to Christ. Everybody like him? Those that had 1,500 years of the Old Testament to prepare them to receive him were the very ones who put him to death. And yet he could stand on the Mount of Olives, look at Jerusalem, and, and cry over them because of their own rejection over hundreds of years of the truth that God had given to them. And then in 627, this fits very well here too, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. When you look at all of the stuff that's going on in these riots, and you look at a lot of the way that people want to deal with it. We're not talking about self-defense. We're not talking about law and order. They have their place, Romans chapter 13, and they're being ignored, actually, those truths of God concerning civil government and the power to correct folks and to protect the honest. But the point is that, you know, you might hear people say sometimes, I'd just like to slap his jaws. Well, or maybe more than that. Well, we may have those feelings, but if we know the truth of Christian living, we refrain from doing so. We restrain ourselves. What restrains us? Truth of how a Christian lives, which is an example coming from Christ and how he dealt with people. It's not talking about not calling them police when your house is being robbed. That has nothing specifically to do with persecuting you because you're a Christian. Our self-defense, that has nothing necessarily to do with persecuting you because you're a Christian. But there's a way you get along with people. And people are disarmed many times when you continue to treat them right when they're doing wrong to you. And he just says here, doing good to them that hate you. Chapter 638, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I'll be so bold and frank to say this. A lot of men in the church don't believe that. You say, well, why would you say that? I know how to give. The Bible says you give as I teach you to give because Christianity is a giving service-oriented religion as the Bible teaches doing those things. And what does he say you're going to receive? Good measure, press down, shake it together, running over. Now, you know, that's a qualified statement. What if you don't give? You're still going to receive the good measure, press down, shake it together, running over. No, because everything there is about being faithful to God involves giving. We first, in becoming a Christian, give ourselves. Paul said of the Macedonians, poor people that they were, they surprised him in what they gave. And he said, I know the reason they did it. They first gave themselves. But when you give yourself to something, whatever you have goes with it. If you don't give yourself to something, you're not apt to give as you could and should. In verse 39 of chapter 6, he says, can the blind guide the blind? And this question is applicable both to teachers and hearers. As I said, James says, be not many masters or be not many teachers, for we shall receive the greater condemnation. So there's always a need for those who are teachers to check upon themselves, as Luke said, be certain, be cautious, be careful. Because if the blind who can't see are leading other blind people who can't see, there is a destination for them. They'll all fall in a ditch. So who really is the one to lead the blind? 
those that can see, but he's making a spiritual application. Who should be leading those who are blind to the truth? Those who have seen the truth, understand the truth, and are living the truth. Thus, Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In verse 43, there's no good tree that bringeth forth corrupt fruit, nor again a corrupt tree that bringeth forth good fruit. We usually apply that to things pertaining to Christianity, but it fits in anything. Somebody's out here declaring they want unity in this country, and they want peace in this country. They want contentment in this country. They want unity in this country. Well, of course, in reality, none of those sort of things can be had as God wants them, except through the gospel, belief, and obedience to it, and the unity that's found in the church under the authority of Christ. But when people say that, and yet they begin to destroy and to fight and to put people down and make light of folks that are unreasonable, then... Uh, I know the fruit they bear, and they can say they want unity, and they can say whatever it is is good, but look at what they're doing. And it speaks far louder than what they say they want. So there's no good tree that bringeth forth corrupt fruit, nor again a corrupt tree that bringeth forth good fruit. Verse 43, there's another lesson. That's why it's by their fruit we, sh we shall know them. We all make judgments. We were made, created by our creator to make judgments. We just must judge on the basis of a proper standard and in all honesty and objectivity with the facts. So when people are trying to say, well, I want this, that, or the other, that they're working in their lives, bringing out fruit that works right the opposite, then pardon me if I don't believe you. I don't believe you at all. Then in verse 46 of chapter 6, why call me, me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's one of the most powerful passages in all the Bible. Lord means that you are over my life, my every thought, word, and action. I'm seeking your will, not mine. Well, then, if you are, then why aren't you doing what I tell you? So it does no good to say Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He's Lord in Christ. But you don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to worship God according to the authority of the New Testament, and so on and so forth. So to acknowledge Jesus as Lord means to seek to know his will for your life. When we come to the widow of Nain who lost her son, she was grieving over that in chapter 7, verse 13. Notice that Christ had compassion on her. It just simply comes down to this. Without compassion as the Lord had and exemplified to us, and that we cannot be his people in reality. So many times... We have compassion on people who don't need compassion, and we withhold compassion from those who need it. Now, how can I know which is which? You won't if you don't know the truth. You won't at all. Uh, so it just comes down, and all said and done, proper study of the Bible, and all honesty and objectivity, that you'll be able to recognize these things. In one sense, we should be having compassion on everybody because when you see a person doing evil, you know where that person is going to wind up for eternity if he doesn't change to fit the truth of God's Word. And in that sense, we have compassion on people. We have compassion on them when we prepare to teach the gospel to them, when we set godly examples before them, when we want them to see themselves as God sees them and then do something about it repent of their sins and believing the gospel and obey the truth. And of course, this ties back in the fundamental matter of 
at what point does God remit one's sins? And men reject the counsel of God when they refuse to be buried with Christ in baptism, no matter how much they believed in him and confessed him before men to be such, and repented of their sins. If they're not immersed by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, that's his will, chapter 7 and verse 30, then they're not going to be saved. And then again, we preach many times, chapter 8, verse 11, that the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Thus again, we must be careful that we sow the seed of the kingdom, that we teach the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, without addition, subtraction, alteration, any form or fashion. That means we've got to know how the Bible authorizes. We've got to know the meaning of words. We've got to know, first of all, how to get ourselves straight in line with the truth that we might teach others. Notice verse 18 where he talks about the good ground. The good ground. Well, he likened that to the people with honest and good hearts. They heard the word and they keep it. And they bring forth fruit with patience. I'll talk a little bit about patience. Patience is, is that when you're doing what's right and you know what's right and, and you have to undergo persecution of some sort or the other because you know you're doing what the Bible says, you don't stop. That's the way patience is used in the Bible. It hurts to do good, but you keep doing good no matter how much it hurts. You don't let anyone whatever they do or don't do to you, whether it's in your family or out of your family, stop you from doing what God said. And then you have chapter 8, verse 18, that always is needful. Take heed therefore how you hear. How you hear. I wonder how many sermons are heard, and they're good sermons. But the person hearing them doesn't really apply the truth he's hearing to his own life. It may be that a whole host of folks around you need that and may need it more than you. But you first must apply it to your own life. And thus to the elders, Paul said, take heed to yourselves. To the young preacher, he said, take heed to yourself. If anybody wants to become a Christian, you're going to have to start by taking heed to yourself. And that means how you hear the truth of God's word. And then the matter of denying oneself, chapter nine, verse 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, it may be that today you have done everything, and I hope that's the case with all of us, that the Bible requires of you and you've borne your cross today. Well, if the sun comes up tomorrow, because you bore your cross today doesn't mean tomorrow's taken care of. Now, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, so we deal with today and whatever tomorrow brings, or if tomorrow doesn't even come for us, then we're ready for it. But it's not once done, and it's over with. It's taking up our crosses daily. In chapter 9, verse 62, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. There are folks that know the truth, humbly obey the truth, and live it for a while. But they get tired of bearing that cross daily. And they start yearning to be where there's no pressure where there are no problems that have been brought on because you love the truth and live it. And if you become a Christian, you're going to have problems that people of the world don't have. That doesn't mean they won't have problems, but you're going to have problems that come upon you because you are living like the Lord said and teaching what the Lord said teach and defending the gospel. Some people get tired of that, and they, uh, they want to compromise. They want to give up. They want to leave. They want to, let's, just, let's just get away from this mess. Well, there is no getting away from, quote, this mess, unquote, in this world. You face all of the messes of this world that Satan's created and sustains by living like the Bible says. 
So we don't want to look back and say, oh, I miss all those things of the world that I used to be a part of. Then he says plainly, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. We need, again, and this ties back into the attitude of compassion, we need to develop and cultivate a benevolent spirit like the Good Samaritan, chapter 10, 30 through 37. Anybody did good to somebody that hated him, the Samaritan did. Because the Jews in general just despised them. But look how he treated them. We won't spend more time on that because we said what we said about compassion and not uh, doing evil to people who hate us, but having a benevolent spirit, looking for opportunity to do good to folks who can't help themselves, Galatians 6.10. Then, of course, what Abraham Lincoln quoted, but Jesus is the one that said it. Originally, in chapter 11, verse 17, a house divided against itself can't stand. It falls. And from Amos, we have, can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, that's true, whether it's husbands and wives, whether it's a family, whether it's a church. So how do we do that? Well, we don't do as we please. We do as the Lord pleases. And when you've got a whole church full of folks saying, let's do what the Lord said, then they'll give up anything they like to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, Ephesians 4. In chapter 11, verse 52, he talks about those who take away the key of knowledge. And he pronounces a word. O upon them, a W-O-E upon them, the key of knowledge. That would cover the importance of proper knowledge. Again, I'll refer you to John 8, 31 and 32. If you remove from your life the knowledge of God's word, the importance of learning it and living it because it is God's word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, then you're going to turn to one of those spiritually blind people. And remember, you cannot turn away from any truth of the Bible without turning to a lie. It's impossible. So there has to be the key of knowledge in all of us, the hungering and thirsting after righteousness the desire to know the truth that we can do it. James says, again, uh, whosoever is in the law of liberty, continueth in the law of liberty. If you live according to it, if you abide in it, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I'd say that person had found the key of knowledge because he's looking at the perfect law of liberty and continuing in it. Well, the perfect law of liberty is the New Testament. And there's where the real knowledge is concerning salvation. Chapter 1152. And then uh, very quickly, we need to have an attitude that will look at the facts for what they are. that will create a repentant mind as it did in the prodigal son. And we need not be like the elder brother. Now, really this parable fits the Jews and their attitude toward the Gentiles when they would come to the truth. We can't like be like either one of them, but if we are somebody who has gone against the truth, having once learned it, lived it, then the attitude of the prodigal ought to be developed in us. And we should be willing to be forgiving as the elder brother needed to be, chapter 15, 25 through 32. And then how, we may say, how sad that the sons of this world are often wiser than the sons of light, chapter 16, verse 8. Now, he's not saying be like worldly people. They're worldly. God never said be worldly. In fact, he teaches right the opposite. Love not the world, even the things that are in the world. 
And then he talks about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are of the world. The world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So John wrote. Well, then what does he mean? Well, he's talking about learning to use our fleshly bodies and what we have of this world in a wise way for the good of the kingdom. And sometimes brethren don't have a lick of sense when it comes to how to handle things of this world for the good of the kingdom. They just don't. Now you say, where'd you get that from? I read my Bible and I read what Jesus said here and he had a message for me. And he's telling me the people of this world who are worldly can use things to benefit themselves in this world when members of the church who should know why they're in this world as pilgrims and strangers just passing through, proving their faith in God and love of God and their desire to be in heaven, and they don't know how to use the affairs of this world to further the cause of Christ. And then chapter 17, 10, when we've done all that has been commanded us, we should still have the disposition of mind that we are unprofitable servants. We've simply done what was our duty to do. Chapter 17, 10. That ought to let us know that no man can live a flawless life. You can live a faithful life. You must live a faithful life. Heaven is only for those who die faithful. But when we do those things we're obligated to do to be faithful to God in the New Testament, we've only done our duty. It doesn't mean that we're everything in the flesh that we could be, if we could, then by the law, a pure law system, we could have been saved if we could have kept it. Jesus kept it perfectly, so death couldn't hold him. If any one of us could have kept the law, or if you could come into this world and never sin, there wouldn't be anything that could uh, cause you to be lost. But the Bible's clear. All of sin comes from the glory of God, Romans 3.23. So what we need to understand is that when we learn what's required of us in the obligatory matters in the New Testament to be faithful, then we need to say we're just doing what our duty is. It's still going to be the grace and mercy of God Almighty extended to us through the gospel that lets him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Wherever we reach that stage where we think we've arrived, we don't need to study anymore, pray anymore, try to be better, check up on ourselves, be sober-minded, pray without ceasing, grow in our giving, then we're going to start sliding backwards. And then the last point, and we won't try to go into the Herods tonight, and that is, uh, remember, these are lessons you probably find more, but the last one I've got right here is, like the first disciples, we need to continue to worship God with great joy. Chapter 24, 52 through 53. And all this COVID-19 business where we've had to miss services and still aren't back on our regular schedule, it is something in, in all my life. I've been a Christian since uh, May 27th, 1959. I've never known anything like it, where something was hindering us from our regular worship periods. Never gone through that, never anticipated it, but it has. And uh, do you miss it? Do you miss one another? Do you miss the fellowship, the joy of being together, visiting? Well, there's something wrong if we don't. And it's not the Bible that's wrong. It's not the gospel that's wrong. It may be just pointing out to us that we don't really care that much about these things. So we need to enjoy worshiping with one another as we worship God. We need to have the same attitude toward our work together as we spread the gospel, defend the faith, edify one another. Chapter 24, 52 through 53. Well, those are the lessons I picked out going all the way through it. As I say, you can find others. Even in the lessons I brought out, you can add to it others. And it's already about 820. Or a little longer this week. We did last week. So We'll look at the Herodian family before we start into the Gospel of John. It won't take too long next week if the Lord wills. Any questions? Any comments?